I really do appreciate you coming today. Uh, my name is Sharon Harris, and um, I used to be president of the Advocates for Self-Government, so that's probably how if you know me, you would know me from that. But I retired about a year ago, and I'm actually loving being retired. I was surprised because I love my job for 20 years, and uh, I still love, um, of course, still love liberty and still want to help the libertarian cause. So I'm still going around doing um, workshops and and writing and so forth. So, but I just have a little extra time to spend on other things, so I'm really enjoying that. Um, as we do this, it's somewhat informal, and I ask you at any time if you have a question or a comment or something you want to share about what I'm talking about, just raise your hand. I'm glad to have people interrupt, uh, so that, that will be fine. What we're going to talk about today is how to be a super communicator for liberty. And, uh, what I've done is put together, just, I've studied this for a long time, probably 25 years, and try to gather every communication tip I can possibly find to share with libertarians because I want us to get the message out. And in fact, that's what we're talking about. Uh, we wonder why, you, why would you want to be a super, super communicator? Well, it's kind of obvious, but one thing is the importance of the message that we have. That, as you know, you wouldn't be here if you didn't believe that our message is very, very important. And interestingly, uh, during this campaign, if you, I'm sure you've noticed, like me, you're probably political junkies like I am, and you've been watching all the campaigning and everything. And um, our voice is not there right now until we get out there and do it. Uh, no one is talking about civil liberties. No one is talking about peace. Uh, it's really disturbing in some ways, uh, kind of people fighting over who can get the most powerful and build the biggest government and, and all of those things. So our message is just extremely important, and the consequences of failure for our message is just catastrophic. As you know, we have to get this message out. The, the, me the big government is, is there, right now their message is really growing because they're hearing about it every day. Just an example. Um, I don't know if you saw this, but the other day I saw a poll that asked Americans, how many would you, would you support repealing Obamacare? And interestingly, something like 55% said yes. And I'm thinking, oh, that's pretty good, because it's moved up from like 40% up to 55%, that's pretty good. But then, when they ask, would you like to replace it with a one-payer system, like Medicare, like 80% of those people said that's what they wanted to replace it with. So it was like, they've been listening to Bernie Sanders and his, getting his message out there, okay? We need to get our message out, and that's what's so important. We have lots of competition out there, lots of other ideas are being, uh, being sent out there. The other guys are experts. They have, they pay millions of dollars to linguist, linguist, linguistians, or whatever, linguists, to, to tell them how to say things effectively and to give them talking points that they can repeat over and over and the media takes it out there for them. So, um, so that's, that's why we need to be a, a super communicator. The message makes all the difference in the world and we really need to get it out there. So there's nothing really wrong with the message, but sometimes there's something wrong with the messenger. And that's what we're gonna talk about here. I know I have made so many mistakes uh, in my life of turning people off to libertarianism. So I've tried to learn how to turn them on to libertarianism. And so those are the ideas that I want to share with you. And it's really fairly simple to communicate, as you know. I mean, all, all that's involved in, in communicating is you've got a, a person talking and a person listening, right? You've got the communicator and the listener. And it's just a very simple thing. You just tell the person something and they get it, right? I mean, it's a, Let's just do a little experiment, if you don't mind playing a little game here with me. Um, I would like to just demonstrate how simple it is to communicate an idea. So I would like to ask you if you're willing to participate, and of course you don't have to, you're a libertarian because I know I'm not. But um, if you would just pick everybody, just get a partner, and just kind of sit next to your partner, we'll just need two people in each group. You just turn around and somebody decide. Okay? <laughs> That's good. Okay. Grabby, grabby somebody. Does anybody not have a partner who does want to participate? Doesn't have a partner that can be my partner. Does anybody want to be my partner? Okay. Everybody who wants a partner have one. Okay. If in your little group here, you assign one of one of you will be A and one of you will be B. Okay. Just decide which one. Doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Now all okay, all the A's are going to be the communicators. And the B's are going to be the listeners, okay? So are you ready? I'm going to ask the A's to communicate a simple message to the listeners. And here's the message I want you to communicate. I want you to communicate a song, okay? Now, a song, okay? So the catch is that you can't sing and you can't hum. You can't do any of those things to communicate. You just have, all you can do to communicate the song is to tap on the chair before you. Is to tap out the song. That's all you can do. And no fear, no hints, no talking, no humming, no anything. I'll give you just a few seconds to think of a song. And just think of a song that you're pretty sure the other person would know, okay? A popular song. Don't, don't let it be a song you wrote last week, you know, that nobody's heard. That, that's, that's cheating, okay? That's not fair. Okay, so come up with a song. It's a fairly simple song. And when I say go, I'm going to have you tap out that song. And listeners pay really close attention and listen to the tapping. And as soon as you get the song, just raise your hand. I got it, okay? And so I'm going to give you about a minute to, to play this game and see. Because most of you will get it pretty quickly, I think, probably. So let's just, let's just try it. So go. No talking and no humming. trying really hard, a lot of times, to understand what you're saying. 
and yet they can't understand it because you're you're just using one mode and that's why we want to have lots of different ways to communicate lots of different tips and techniques that we can use a toolbox that we can use in different situations to get the message out there and we have to remember the curse of knowledge has to do with the fact that you are in a, it's not that you're smarter than the other person sometimes you might be smarter than the other person okay but a lot of times you're not you're talking to somebody who's a genius who can't understand what you're saying or doesn't doesn't get what you're saying but it's because you're not saying it in a way that particular person can hear. Because everybody comes from a different place. So if that person is just, that person may be a nuclear physicist and know everything about physics, and they try to talk to you about physics, and if you don't know anything about physics, you're just like, what are you talking about, right? It's the same thing with libertarianism. It's a, it's a topic that's, that's, you know, that's a major topic that some people have a thought of before. Or they haven't thought very much about it, or maybe they have another opinion that's really strong that overrides what you're saying. So all of these things, remember that you do have the person of knowledge, and so what you need to do with that is to always be willing to, to start where that person is. And I'm going to teach you some techniques to learn how to do that, how to understand where the person is and what they need from you in order to understand what you're trying to say. So we're going to work on the messenger, and that's the main idea that we have here. Um, so there are a lot of things you need to realize about the, uh, about the messenger and how we can be a better messenger. What is the first rule of libertarian communication? And that's kind of like, well, listen is the, one of the first things you need to do. We're going to talk extensively about that. The first rule is to do no harm. Just like the doctor's rule, the, the idea of do no harm. That just simply means to your, your job is to be, make a good impression. With the, with the other person, not make a bad impression. And you have probably seen some people who have done that. That they, you know, we talk about the messenger, you hear the, the phrase, with somebody shot the messenger. Sometimes you want to shoot the messenger. You know, why did you say it that way to make that impression? Why did you do that? Why did you make such a bad impression? So, and we, are we one of the people who are mad at ourselves for making a bad impression? But the first rule is to do no harm. To realize, one of the things that we have to realize is that we, and this is hard for us as libertarians because we're individuals. We don't like the idea that we represent a group of people, but we do. We represent libertarians. Anytime you talk about libertarianism in something, you represent all libertarians. Whether you like it or not, it's just true. I tell you a little thing that happened just a couple of days ago when I got to the hotel. I went to the restaurant and I went to have a breakfast buffet. And so I, I went over to get a special omelet made for me. And the guy was really nice who was making the om omelets. And he was trying to be really helpful and all. And this guy in front of me, he was kind of gruff and he said, you know, he, and he, he was looking like this, like he didn't like the way the guy was making. And the guy said, do you want cheese in it? And he said, no, Germans do not like cheese. And, and the guy says, oh, OK, you know, like that. And so he's trying to make it the way he wants it. And he finished, he said, he said here, sir, he said, it's really overdone. Like that, you know, and the, and the guy felt really bad because he was trying to do a good job. And so the guy took it anyway and he walked off. And I found myself thinking, oh, God, you know, the first thought that came to my mind, boy, Germans are kind of hard to get along with. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, where did that come from? But I think that's a, that, that's a natural thing that we have is we think, you know, that person represents, he represented Germans because I hadn't been around a German in a long time. So here, here was his representative of Germany. He didn't realize he was representing a whole country, you know. <laughs> but that's really what happens with human beings, that we, that we tend to judge people that way, you know. So people, I guarantee you, though, you start talking about libertarianism, they think you represent all libertarians. So anytime they ask you a question, you see people, I mean, just like we feel about our candidates, we're watching our candidates and we want them to say the right thing, you know, so they won't embarrass us. Well, that's, we're, we're at representatives too, even if we're not running for office, we're representatives. So the first rule is to do no, no harm. To be a good neighbor is one thing that's really important. Just to be involved in your community if, at all, if you can at all. Because what happens if people get to know you, they know you're a nice person, that you're a good person, that you're a helpful person, that you're that you are a, a civil person, you know, the, a kind person, a helpful person. So it's one of the things that Carl Hess was famous for. I don't know if any of you ever had the uh, um, opportunity to meet him. A wonderful gentleman, and he lived in West Virginia and he helped his neighbors build their barns. I mean, he was just everybody loved him in his neighborhood. 
And so when then when you got to talk about politics, they were more open to hearing what he had to say because they knew he was a good person and they liked him. So to be a good neighbor, show courtesy and respect to people. Some of these things are basic, but we don't think about them sometimes when we're out campaigning or when we're when we're talking politics because politics is very abrasive sometimes. And and um, and so then we come to listening, like you mentioned. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about listening and how important that is. It's a very important. To be agreeable. We can disagree and still be agreeable, right? We can agree to disagree but still be agreeable. And that's something we kind of learn to do. Because sometimes it makes you mad when somebody doesn't agree with you. Um, establishing rapport is very important. We're going to talk a couple of things that you can do to, to get instant rapport with people. Um, you want to get on the same wavelength with them. You know, you want to get have an agreement between you. Um, patience is another thing we need because remember, how long did it take you to become a libertarian? Did anybody had anybody want to share experience of like when they first heard the word libertarian and then they started studying it and it took them a while? Or, or did it take you a while? Yeah. yeah. No. Did you just actually, well, actually, it did take a little while. Somebody had stuck one of those Ron Paul for 2012. Uh -huh. the president on a stop sign yeah. that I stopped at numerous times, you know, a day and week. And finally I said, that was Ron Paul. And went to Google and looked at that. Found the, the thing they called and got hooked up with libertarians and said, no, the, these people won't leave you the way I so believe. There's somebody who agrees with me in the world. Yeah. yeah. That's right. I've got kindred spirits. That's right. That's wonderful. And a lot of us have that kind of experience, and a lot of us, there's always a few people in the room who said they were born libertarian. They just they just have always been libertarian. But most of us had to kind of struggle with some of the issues at first. And and maybe we agreed with 80%, and then there were 20 that 20% that no, well, I'm not going to agree with that. But after a while, and we started listening and reading about it and thinking about it, we became so some of us took some time to become libertarian. So be patient with other people. And when they when they catch on, you know, they like a certain part of it and everything, congratulate them on being so smart that they figured this out. You know, I mean, seriously, just that that, that that instead of attacking them for the one thing they disagree or the two things they disagree with or whatever, that have patience with people. You'll be surprised that they will become libertarians if they start hanging out with libertarians. You invite them to meet other libertarians. Um, uh, it's just kind. It's kind of like the cucumber being put in the brine. You know, it doesn't. The brine doesn't become cucumber. The cucumber becomes a pickle. You know, it's like it gets just surrounded by, by that. So, uh, so one of the things that's really good to learn is to learn a little bit of psychology about how people think and how people, uh, how the brain works and stuff like that helps you in understanding how to communicate. It helps you to understand some of some of the things you can study as personality types. Any of you are familiar with the Myers-Briggs type indicator? Anybody? Okay, a few of you are. Uh, learn some more about that because it's really, really helpful. I have a workshop I do totally on that, which I won't get into today because I don't have time. But you can learn that there are certain personality types that are naturally attracted to libertarianism, and, and those people you can convert really quickly just by telling them that it's there. And then there are people you have to work a little harder with but, it, but it, amazingly, libertarianism is the one philosophy, one political philosophy that can actually appeal to all the political types, all the personality types. And so it's just really fun to learn how to, how to do that. Uh, learn about sales. And we, sometimes we don't think, you know, oh, God, I don't want to be a salesman, salesman, or, you know, have a bad reputation or something. But the fact is you are selling libertarianism. And so get used to that idea that you are selling yourself and libertarianism when you talk about it. So learn some sales ideas. Learn how to be a good salesman. The best salesmen are serving other people, are finding ways they can fill people's needs. And that's what we're doing. We're, we're providing solutions to their problems. We're not trying to force something on somebody. We're providing good, good solutions for them. So learn about sales and smile. It's like sometimes we get so serious we forget to smile. And there's some, there's some studies that have been done that's sort of really interesting that, that if you that, that if you are with somebody and you just smile, even if you're having to almost fake it, you know, think about something happy or something, and you start smiling, the other person is going to start smiling. It's almost impossible. You can even stand people up and say, now don't smile no matter what, and then smile on them, and they will smile. It's just like, you know, and when you're smiling, you feel favorable toward the other person. So try not to be so heavy and negative and, and that kind of thing, even though this is serious. It's serious. 
but it's also something joyful too that we want to share with people. Um, and that comes with enthusiasm that these ideas are so great. Do you ever just stop and think sometimes, you know, wow, this is so cool, these solutions that we have. And you see them when they work, you just get so excited. I was so excited, I used Uber for the first time just a couple of days ago. And man, I mean, I was already a supporter of Uber because I love the idea of people just being able to have their own business right, working when they want to and a company working without having to go through all the licensing and all the crazy certification and all these things. I mean, Uber is a good example of a, of a libertarian solution to things and so forth, but I hadn't really used it yet. When I used it, I was like, I had seen a miracle. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I called him like, I'm, I'm a raging, you know, I'm thinking, well, he'll probably be here 15, 20 minutes. And he pulls up, you know, it's like two, two minutes or five minutes after I call. And it's just so wonderful. And, and when I would talk to the drivers, they would all tell me how great it worked for them, you know. So you, you can't help but be enthusiastic and passionate about this. I, I recommend everybody to have, try to have the passion of Jeffrey Tucker. You know who Jeffy Tucker is, and if you don't know, watch one of his videos, and you'll just sit, you'll just start smiling and laughing, and he's just so into the idea of freedom and liberty and everything, he just can't help but smile all the time. And so people are more attracted to to you when you're happy and when you're when you're doing this. Uh, golden rule is something, and it's not you know he who has the most gold in. That's, that's not the golden rule. The golden rule is you. Sets the rules, and sometimes that's true too. But um, but the golden rule is simply do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Or the reverse of that: do not do to others what you would not like to have done to you. So how many of you would ever like somebody to scream at you and say, "If you don't agree with me, you're stupid"? <laughs> no, but and how did, did that ever persuade you? When somebody argued with you or screamed at you or whatever. So that's something that we need to resist the temptation of it. So we sometimes get impatient and want to just really push our ideas on somebody. And even if we don't say the words, you're stupid, the person gets that when we just we act like we think they're, they're stupid. So do that, do that. I want to share with you just a couple of more things that just that things that don't work. Not doing your homework. There's a guy he's asking questions and you just, you know. He's asking you legitimate questions and you're just saying, um, Mark will take care of that, Mark will take care of that. So you didn't do the homework to give the person real answers, real examples, real stories to, to share with them. Lapel grabbing is one that is harder to do. But oh man, you've got to hear this, you've got to read this book, you've got to do this. <laughs> so so that, that's another thing that doesn't. Think about when people have done that to you. You know, they've either they just joined a new church, or they've just read a book, or they've just seen a movie that they want you to see, and they just like won't leave you alone, and you're just like, get away from me. You know? So we do that sometimes. I think not listening, of course, and we're going to discuss listening even more. But just he's talking, he's asking something, they're just just going on without even listening to what they're saying. Throwing books at them. I like this one. Here, read these books, and when you after you finish, I'll explain them to you. <laughs> so, that that doesn't really work. Um, winning arguments. How many people didn't hear like to argue? And come on, admit it. Some people did. Yeah, even Chris likes to argue. No, <laughs> no, we don't. But it is kind of fun sometimes. But you know what? It it really doesn't. <laughs> you know, it it can be if it's your sport of choice, you know. Go right ahead, you enjoy it, makes you happy. But don't think of it as something that's going to help you convert people to libertarians and spread the ideas of liberty. Uh, you'll be kind of like Dave Barry, and here's what he says. I argue very well as any of my remaining friends. I can win an argument on any topic against any opponent. People know this and steer clear of me at parties. Often, as a sign of great respect, they don't even like me. And I actually knew somebody who that literally happened to. He was a libertarian who every time he went to a party, he got in an argument with somebody. And he overheard someone talking and said, we'd really like for George's wife to come, but we don't want to invite him. And, he heard it, and it was like, well, it was totally shocking. And it hurt his feelings really badly. But then he came to realize, you know, that's what he was doing. And he tried really hard to be better. So, so that was good. So some of the things that do work, one of them is that the, uh, what we talked about before is listening. Sometimes this liberty has to kind of just keep your mouth shut and listen to what other people have to say. 
There are lots of benefits to listening. There's a, there's a Dogbert cartoon that shows him, he says, he says, oh, don't ever listen to other people. They're either agreeing with you or they're stupid. <laughs> and uh, so sometimes I think we have Dogbert's attitude, you know, that, that that's probably not a very good, good way to deal with people. It's not easy to listen because, you know, nobody ever teaches us how to do that. And especially when you have a lot of ideas and you want to tell people, it's hard to take the time or the patience to listen. Um, it's a way of showing respect to other people. It's a way that you can discover the real concern that they have. And why is that important? You, you want to, why do you want to know what their concerns are? Oh, we got that. That gives you the, uh, the direct path to uh, what angle you need to take to reach. Why? Right. It tells you what issue, once you know what their concerns are, you can address that issue and not another issue that they don't even care about. You know, you don't want to spend your time talking about gun control with somebody that, that if that doesn't interest them at all, they're interested in health care or something, you know. So you find out what they're really interested in first. You learn their misconceptions. They'll tell you if you listen that they think libertarians are fill in the blind. They think we're conservatives or they think we're they think we're liberals. Or they think we're we don't have any compassion, that we don't care about the poor, or that all these things they have misconceptions about us. And for various reasons. Some of it is because we haven't been good communicators, but some of it is because the media has misconceptions and they spread it, or our enemies spread the, deliberately spread misconceptions, or people who misunderstand spread that. So there are a lot of reasons for that, but we can we can learn those misconceptions and we can we can address those. We can tell them that, you know, we can tell them the, the truth about that. Uh, we discover areas of agreement. That's one of the coolest things about it. Because when you're talking to somebody the first time about libertarianism, have you ever met anyone who disagreed with every libertarian position? There, there's no way. You couldn't, you would have to be some kind of, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe some dictator in, in somewhere around the, in a third world country or something who thinks he owns everything and tell, you know, he may d disagree on every libertarian. But I you're not gonna find that socialists even will agree with us on some things. They might, you know, you'll find some somebody who's a if somebody's a socialist like um, who's a who's a true socialist, not a progressive. You know, they're, they're, the the liberal part of the the political spectrum has changed over the years, so that a lot of liberals aren't really what we think of as liberals, where in terms of like believing in civil liberties, freedom of speech. All, peace and all that stuff, they become more like progressives who just believe in government. That's, they're, they are big government people. They believe government is the solution to everything. So they really don't care about civil liberties and they, they often want to go to war over everything. Um, so, they, so those people are not really, the people that are, that are real socialists, like principled socialists, they will disagree with us totally on economics. And they will disagree with us on individual, you know, individualism and everything. But they, a lot of times, agree with us, say, on foreign policy or something. They'll agree, they'll be peaceniks or whatever. Or they, or they will believe in, um, they will be, believe in not having corp corporations uh, run the government or something. We, and we might agree totally with them on, on the position that corporations take right now, on crony capitalism, that kind of thing. So you, you'll find agreements on everything. So when you do find agreements, that's what you do, is you emphasize that at the beginning. That's the main thing you want to, you, want to, you know, did you know, you know, libertarians agree with you on that. You know, we're, we're on your side with that, and, and here's why, and here's how we can help you, or whatever. So you learn that by listening also. And interestingly, we have a kind of a sense of reciprocity, human beings do, and turn about spare place, so if you listen to somebody else, they tend to want to listen to you too. They think, it's really funny, this uh, uh, marketing guru named, um, named uh, Abraham, J. Abraham, uh, he tells a story, he's like this real extroverted person who loves to talk and everything, but he said that one time he was staying in a hotel and he saw this guy sitting in the lobby all by himself, just sitting there, so he had to talk to him. So he goes over to him, you know, he says, oh, hi, I'm J. Abraham, how are you today? And the guy said, oh, I'm fine, I'm, I'm here. He said, well, why are you here in town? Well, I'm here. I'm starting a new business. He said, tell me about it. And he says that was all he said. He told me that Kyle was so excited about his business, he started telling all these details about it. He talks for like 30 minutes, and Jay Abraham's just kind of nodding and everything. And then it gets time for both of them to leave. So they get up, and the guy turns around to him and says, 
know, you're the most interesting person I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> and it is true. It's like we tend to think people are interesting if they're interested in us. You know, it's just you know, kind of an interesting way that people that people think. So there are ways that we can learn. It. Listening is really hard, and so it's something that we can practice and that we have to practice to be able to learn it. And so um, before we get to that, I'm, uh, I want to give you a cut of just a little chance to just do another exercise that will kind of demonstrate some of the things about, about listening and about good listeners. You want to keep your same partner. And anybody who didn't have a partner before, if you want to get a partner now, um, a partner, uh, find somebody to partner with. And the person, let's just let the person A and B be the same. So the A is going to be, in this particular one, is going to be the communicator. And the B is going to be the listener. And your assignment is the A person is to tell that person how you became a libertarian. And the listener's job is to listen and really genuinely listen because there's going to be a test. Okay? So you're going to need to know what that person said. Okay? So pay attention really closely to what the person said. And you're only going to have about 45 seconds. This needs to be a fairly short thing just to kind of give them the idea of how you first heard of libertarianism or why you're a libertarian or how you became a libertarian, something along those lines. So, go. <laughs>
about liberty a lot of times, but not good at listening to somebody else, and that's something that we have to do if we're going to be it. One of the th tips that you can use is the power of questions. Instead of lecturing or telling people things, you can ask them questions. And one of the things we already covered in the listening, ask them what they what they they meant by that, or what they did you say this, or or ask them for more information, and that kind of thing. That's one way you ask questions. But you also can ask questions like um, to get information, like you know, ask ask about them. You know, just ask you know, well, tell me about you. Where are you from? Or what? Or or do you consider yourself a, a conservative or a liberal? How do you you know, or something like that? And then let them talk about their pathway and where they came from and so forth. And just so just get information. When you get information, you get permission. You can ask them, you can say, you know, well, can I tell you a little bit more about that? And that's a really good thing to say. If you're if you're talking about something, sometimes people don't want a whole lot of information, they just want a little bit of information. So if you want to tell them more, say, so would you like to hear more about that? Or can I share another story with you? And just so the person has a chance to say, well, you know, I'm really busy right now, I need to go. But let them get away so they don't feel like you're just badgering them. Um, you get the other person to question their views, which is really interesting. Um, you, can, you can point out something very kindly, not in a negative way, but just kind of point out, well, you know, that's interesting. That, would you think that maybe that would cause this? You know, and just let, you know, kind of let them question that. And then sometimes you can even get them to come up with the right answer themselves, which is really cool. Um, they, um, one, just a good example is say, say you knew somebody who was really, their biggest thing was to take care of the poor. They, they, they really wanted to do that. They worked for that. And they wanted, they really thought the government was a place for that, so they supported welfare programs and all of this. And you could ask them something like this. You could say, let me just ask you something. I see that you really do care about taking care of the poor. And I'd like to ask you, if, what if you won the lottery tomorrow and you had a million dollars and after you paid the government half of it, you have 500000 and you can give it to the poor. And you were going to give it all to help the poor. And you had two choices. You could give it to the government welfare program to distribute, or you could give it to a private charity that had a record of getting 90 or 95 percent of the money directly to the poor. Which one would you choose? And then, be quiet. Because interesting, most people will say that they would go to the private charity. Even though they, they're advocating government because they think they can fix it, they think they can somehow make it work, but if they really just had those two choices, they might think to themselves, you know, I guess I probably would, would try something that I know worked and that, that private charity would really work. And then you don't have to keep lecturing about that. You kind of got it, you know, they got it. And so just don't keep selling after the sale was made, you know, so they can, they can get it for themselves. Uh, I had a really, and here's another example where I ask a question, and just it amazed me that it worked, but it was interesting. I was at um, I was at Freedom Fest. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. A lot of libertarians go there, and conservatives go there. And there were some conservatives that had a booth right across from ours. And I knew the guy. I, I met him and everything. And I knew he was he was a re very religious man, and he was very he was considered himself a conservative. And so he came over and he's kind of looking at our world's most political quiz and everything. He said, you know, I really like libertarians. But one thing, one thing I just can't get into is, is this idea of, of um, gay rights. I just, that scares me. I just don't think gays should be free to do what they want to do and everything. So, so I'm, I'm seeing him as I've talked to him before and he seemed to me to be a very kind, nice person, you know, not a violent person or a mean person or anything like that. So I just came up with this and I said, I said, well, let me just ask you a question. I said, would you favor putting gay people in prison for their views? And he thought about it, for, he did it like this, he went, he never thought of this. And he said, well, no, of course not. You know, and I said, I said, well, you know, if you think there should be a law against something, that's what you're advocating. Is if there's a law, you break the law, you go to jail. If you refuse to go to jail, you can even be shot or killed or whatever if you resist arrest. So he changed his mind on that issue right there while we were standing there, because he had never thought that there was violence involved. He just didn't, people don't think that laws and violence are, there are the same thing. 
So he didn't think of that, and once he, he just had a totally different view. It was really, it was really interesting. So try, try that kind of thing, just to ask questions. I thought this was a pretty good one, the flipping the question, which I saw um, Ron Paul do one time, when Time Magazine asked him um, why, he, why he advocated legalizing drugs. And, and he said, well, you know, I wonder why people advocate putting people in jail for doing drugs. It was like flipping the side, you know, that this, that's the side that seems kind of outrageous rather than this side, just to kind of flip the answer. I thought that was a kind of a, kind of a cool answer, so or something. Who's heard of the Rensburger pivot? I know Chris has. Anybody else heard of it? Well, it's a dance. Who wants to dance the Rensburger pivot with me? It's, actually, it's not a dance. It's not a martial art. But this is a really cool technique that you will love. You will can use this, and it's especially good for you if you ever, if when you're on, if you're on talk radio, or if you're a guest on a, a talk radio show, and you're being asked questions. It's it's a way to deal with hostile questions. Has anybody here ever had hostile questions? Anybody asked some hostile questions? Yes, you know, and and those hostile questions sometimes come because people think we have bad intentions. If they thought we had good intentions, they wouldn't be as hostile toward us. They really think we disagree with them because we have bad intentions. We are bad people. We want bad ends and so forth. So, um, so this is a way to establish rapport in a situation when you have hostile questions. So I'm going to go over the steps real quickly. We don't have a whole lot of time, so I'm just going to go over them real quickly. Um, and we would ordinarily maybe practice some of this, and this is something I would really love for you to practice in your group at, 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 uh, when you get together with other libertarians. Because if, if you learn to do this, you can really make a huge difference. The first step is to stay calm and listen to what the question asks and breathe. Okay? The second step is to ask yourself what the person is really concerned about. What does he or she really want? Make an intelligent guess about that. So that, let's say you're on a, a talk radio show and the uh, person says, you, you libertarians, you want to get rid of schools. You know, or something like that, you know. And, you're, and so, okay, you stop and think for a minute. And what do you think that they, what's their concern? Education. Education. They're interested in education. They want their children to be educated. And they think that we don't. They think that we don't care about education because how could we if we didn't want government schools and so forth. So they're thinking, so, so make an intelligent guess about that, and you can do that pretty quickly. Step three is to kind of decide, do you want the same thing they do? Do you believe in education? Of course, okay. You want your children and other children to be educated, okay? So you share an intent and a goal. So once you realize you share the intent, what you do is you, you, you express to them, you show them that you have the same values in them. And the way you do that is you do something like, okay, here's, here's one question. You want to end welfare. What about the poor? Are you really that cold and heartless? Okay. And so, so you can answer by saying, like you, I am sad and outraged by poverty, or whatever it is that they're talking about. Or like you, I want our children to get the best education ever. But that's the pivot. That's not the answer to the issue. It's just the pivot of turning around that you do have good intentions, that you're not a person with bad intentions. So whatever the issue is, if you agree with them. Now, like if they're saying, you mean you don't want to put everybody in jail? You know, well, <laughs> you don't. So they're right. So you don't say, well, like you, I would like everyone to be in jail. <laughs> so it has to be something you genuinely agree with them about and you have the same intent. So like you, I'm, and it doesn't have to be as long as this. In fact, it's better if it's really a little shorter. Like you, I want to live in a society where the streets are safe for our children. And you do. And then you, you can, that leads into your answer. Of, That's why I believe this and this and this. So you have to have your answer ready after that. But you're turning it around. The person will often think, oh, you know, they, for a second. Now sometimes they won't, sometimes they're just wanting to be hostile. But remember that other people around are listening. And so they, they see you talking to this person or they hear you on the radio and they see you as the kind person with good intentions who's trying to have a legitimate discussion. And the other person is the bad guy. And, that, and that's a good position to be. Instead of arguing with them or screaming back at them 
Well, you, the incentives are here. Instead of doing that, you're saying, you know, I really share your values. That's what you're saying. We share their values. And a lot of people think we don't. They think we have totally different values than them. And we really, we really have it. So like you, I want clean air and water. Uh, like you, I want to know that the food and products I buy are safe. So you, it helps to memorize a phrase or to remember those phrases. And you don't want to go around all the time. You don't want to say, you know, I feel your pain, you know, like, like, like a certain president used to say. But, but, you, but you do want to just, you're just explaining that you have the same age. Keep it short in just one sentence. Make it personal. Use the I. I believe this. And you can sometimes say, you know, libertarians believe this. If you're taught, if you're representing libertarianism to them, you can say, you know, libertarians agree with you about this. Or libertarians share your concern about this. And and be careful not to say, you know, we, we care we care about this. That's why we disagree with you. You know, I mean, you got to keep it agreeable for, as you're transitioning into the next thing you say. So, so um, it's not a trick or deception, it's a clarification. Just simply clar clarify that you have the same values and practice. It's real important to practice. So get somebody to be the, the talk show host and to ask the cost of question, and then you practice practice giving the, the answer, the, the pivot. And then you can go on to your answer, but you pause after that. Don't go immediately into your answer about why we should get government out of schools or something. To say, you know, I really want our children to have the best education possible. And then kind of pause for that, and then you can give your answer. Then you would give your answer. So after, the, after you have to do your homework, have your facts and figures together, have your stories, and that's one of the things that you need to do. If he remains hostile, direct your discussion to others around him, and just kind of get away from him and don't get him to fight with him. And we are going to run out of time, so I'm just going to go Real quick, look through a few things because I want to have your chance to, to um, share or ask questions or whatever. But one of the things we learn to do is to choose our words wisely. So think about what words you use. And um, I'm just going to go through a few things here. Uh, the word business sometimes has a bad, negative connotation because people think of big companies and corporations and everything. You can use words like small business, like mom and pop operations, like entrepreneurship. People love that. People People love small business. They just don't like big business. And so you want to you want to distinguish yourself from that. Property rights sound sometimes to people, oh, that's only people who have mansions and lots of property or something. That's not me. You can say something like your belongings. You, you, you don't want anyone to take your belongings or your possessions or your personal possessions. Uh, I love it when you can come up with things like this, like people have come up with it, to call the debt a grandchild tax. That's a really cool thing, to come up with something like that. People's like, what do you mean? And you can explain that you're talking about putting a burden on your, your grandchildren. The death tax was a great thing. Whoever invented that to call the call the, uh, the the inheritance tax a death tax, which is really everybody's against the death tax. They're like for the inheritance tax because like, oh, I'm not going to inherit this. Like those guys are inheriting everything, you know. But death tax, nobody's for that. So that really worked. Capitalism comes and goes as a positive term. Kind of keep up with that. You get people, the um, different pollsters, uh, particularly um, um, one poll that particularly does it, a Gallup poll, every year they they ask people what their reaction to certain words is socialism, capitalism, uh, things like that. And so keep up with that because sometimes capitalism is popular, sometimes it's not. And when it's not popular, you don't have to use that word or you can explain, you can say free market capitalism. Or you can say to the person, we don't believe in crony capitalism or state capitalism, or we don't believe in capitalism, which I thought was a cute, <laughs> a cute word to say when economists came up with. So, um, so, so just be careful when you use that. When you talk about gun rights, you can, you can talk about guns as a civil liberty, because that's what they want. You can talk about guns, you can cross-dress that to liberals by talking about the right to put someone, a single mom in a bad neighborhood to protect her son and her children. Because that's what it's about. It is a civil liberty. It's, a, it's something, a right that we have to defend ourselves. And so if you talk about it in the right way, people can hear you better. It's not a deception. It's just that you, they can hear you better. The word abolish we love, OK? We want to abolish the FDA, the Department the, um, the of Education. And we can list all those, unlike um, uh, 
Governor Perry, we can list them all. You know, we remember we can list them all. It's not just three. You know, so we can have all these things we want to uh, abolish or eliminate. And people were really scared by that. I thought if you abolish that, you know, what you post the FDA, the food's going to be dangerous or drugs are going to be dangerous or all this stuff. It really scares people. So it's probably best to use words like you know, like maybe replace. We're going to replace the FDA with something much better that really does help. That you know, all these kind of things. Now there are things like. The DEA, yeah, we want to abolish that, okay? The IRS, yeah, we want to abolish that. <laughs> okay, so, so it's okay to use the word abolish, you know, when it's appropriate, just, you know, tell them what you really want to abolish. So um, so these are just some things, these are just some tips that I wanted to share with you. I'm going to give you one more that I'm going to skip around here and give you one more that uh, was one of my favorites that I think is a really good way to, to, to communicate with the people on the left and right. If you ever had anybody say to you, you know, you libertarian, sometimes you sound like a conservative, and sometimes you sound like a liberal, you know? And so the phrase came along, people, a lot of times people will say, oh, we're fiscally, we're phys fiscally conservative and we're socially liberal, okay? And people can kind of understand that. It still makes us sound inconsistent, though. It makes us sound like we're sort of liberal, we're sort of conservative. So here's a much better thing. I call it the libertarian denominator because it makes libertarianism the, the measure across the board, okay? So to instead say, when conservat conservatives who believe in free market economics are libertarian on economic issues, and liberals who are for civil liberties are libertarian on social issues. And what does that do? It says that's how we want to measure is how much liberty you believe in, right? And instantly, good side effect, the person agrees with you half the time. They're libertarian half the time, right? Yeah. If they're liberal, oh, I'm libertarian on that? <laughs> At least they made me think about that. But I think that's a way of showing that we are the ones that are consistent, the liberty all the time. So try using that one. I think you'll enjoy using that. So I've got some other tips in my book that I have here that um, it's, it sells normally for $20. I want anybody here who's taken this class today, you can get it for 10 today. You can go to, to uh, get your bag if you want it. And I wanted to uh, give you, I also want to open, like I said, any questions that you might have about anything. I would like, if you, I would like to pass around this uh, pad right here, if you don't mind. If you would like to know when, because I'm working on another book, and if you'd like to just know when the book comes out or know when we have a training near you or anything like that, or if you want to call me and um, and get me to do a training at your you know at your group, we can do like half day things where we practice all of these things and we can do whatever you want. It can be custom custom made. So if you would just sign your name and email that I can get in touch with you. And if you would mind just passing these out for me while you're going to have a card. It gives your you know, the web website and the email and the phone number and everything so you can call me. Does anybody have any questions or any particular problem that they're dealing with communication-wide that we might want to share some ideas on or anything. Okay, if there are no questions. Yeah, How do I get my communist child in the line? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a word of supporting. Is that, is that the way that the libertarians are supporting? Yeah, my daughter, my daughter was raised by two libertarians and she said, how does anybody come? How does anybody rebel against libertarian parents? You know, and so, so, so yours, yours decided to be communist. Mine decided to be apathetic. That was her only answer. She said, oh, I'll just say I don't care about politics. I'm just apolitical. She did that for a while, but then she broke down with this. For one thing, we named her daddy, so it's sort of hard for her to stay away from, you know, from this stuff. So she started, she, when Facebook opened up to have the name, which you could put Facebook.com in your name, she stayed up till midnight that night and got daddy. So she's Facebook.com slash daddy. And there were people in line for that name. And they wrote her, you beat me by seven seconds. And so she got all these people from around the world named Dagny, who they kind of like a little informal group. And the ones from other countries, that's a popular name in, the, in different countries, like Sweden and Denmark and stuff like that. But if they're from America, they were named after Atlas Shrugged. Every one of them was. So I told them they should have a t-shirt that says, I would have said, said uh, my parents read out with Shrug and all I got was this t-shirt, you know, or this name, Daddy. All I got was this name, Daddy. But, uh, but so, so that was, that was kind of funny. But, 
But anyway, I think you just have to have patients that probably come around eventually, you know. You know, but, but they do children do tend to to, 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 to